Hello, everyone. Welcome to Campus Safety Voices. I'm Robin Hattersley, Editor-in-Chief of Campus Safety Magazine. Police and security departments across the country have adopted body-worn cameras, but there are special challenges in using this type of technology in healthcare settings. One organization that has adopted body-worn cameras is Piedmont Healthcare. In this interview, Piedmont's Director of Public Safety, Mike Hodges, who is also one of this year's Campus Safety Director of the Year finalists, discusses how his department went about adopting this technology and why they adopted it. He also discusses who was involved in the decision, the policies Piedmont developed for officer use of body-worn cameras, and the results of his department's use of this technology. So here's my interview with Mike Hodges. Enjoy the show. Why did your department or an organization start using body-worn cameras? And what are the benefits and versus risks, especially in healthcare? So it's uh, an interesting question. I think um, body-worn cameras, like, like all tools in a, in a security apparatus are all just that. They're a specific tool you pull out of the toolbox for a specific task. And I think that's the approach we've taken towards the cameras. They were, they were an accentuation of our tool set. Uh, and uh, as, we, as we really focus on the development of our security program and our overall uh, physical security apparatus, we really wanted to make sure that we were equipping our team, not only the individual officers, but the program as a whole with the best tools available. And so the, the body-worn camera just became very obvious as an, as an exceptional tool, not only from a de-escalation standpoint, because they do have tremendous value in de-escalation, uh, but also from a uh, liability protection standpoint uh, and from a professional development standpoint. It gives us uh, valuable information on uh, how to uh, debrief and improve. Uh, one of our kind of core guiding principles as an organization, as a security organization, is, is what we call the pursuit of tactical excellence, meaning we want every encounter uh, that we have, whatever that may be, to be better than the encounter we had before. So we're working towards constant improvement and, and the tool, the body-worn camera tool gave us an, an excellent opportunity for, for that level of debrief. Uh, and, then, um, and then, yeah, the tremendous value in de-escalation. Now, there are a lot of hurdles with body-worn cameras, primarily being uh, HIPAA issues uh, associated with protected health information. Uh, and so we had to have a very collaborative approach to the development of our policies and procedures around that tool. But um, uh, but we, we really believe, and I've seen demonstrated uh, since we rolled those cameras out, uh, the benefits far outweigh any potential risks or liabilities. So who was involved in determining your office, you know, that your offices should wear body-worn cameras? Um, well, I was, I was a big proponent, personally. Uh, and so from a, from a security standpoint, I saw the value in the tool. I uh, did uh, a lot of research on where body cameras have been deployed effectively in a healthcare environment uh, and looked at some of the results from the de-escalation standpoint. So I saw, as we looked at kind of the overarching workplace violence prevention program, I saw the value in the tool from that perspective. Um, and then uh, I pushed that uh, forward with you know both my leadership team, but then also collaboratively with our compliance uh, department, with our risk department. Um, and just trying to get as many eyes on the development of the program as possible and make sure that we were looking at all the potential risks uh, and mitigating those. Ultimately, what we came to the conclusion of was it's really, it's no different than a camera in the ceiling uh, that you would have in your regular CCTV system. Uh, it just moves with the officers. And so as long as you can provide the same level of um, you know, backend protection on that data, that you do to your regular CCTV system, then and you've mitigated your liabilities significantly while adding significant value to your security program. So who was involved? I assume it was legal, risk management, maybe nurses, anybody else? No, exactly right. Yeah. So the primary players were um, we had human resource representatives. Uh, we had uh, which included our employee relations uh, folks. We had uh, our compliance. Uh, folks from the legal department uh, who looked at uh, compliance as it relates to uh, HIPAA and, um, and, and those types of uh, regulatory issues. Uh, we did have legal take a look at it along with our risk management um, 
team. Uh, and so we, we looked at it from multiple angles uh, and then brought all of that information back to our executive team to make the final decision. Uh, and, and what we decided upon was really a pilot program. So you know, my organization is a very large organization. And so we've piloted the body worn camera system in one entity first as a kind of a use case to prove the concept and then, uh, and then moved it out from there. So what is your department's policy on the use of body worn cameras? I mean, who, who, which officers wear them? All. Does everybody wear so them? All of our officers. Yeah, all of our officers wear a camera. It's part of their uh, standard duty equipment. They, they check one out at the beginning of every shift, check it back in at the end. Uh, they're accountable for logging their video uh, and making sure that it's attached to uh, any kind of incident report numbers. Uh, and then uh, part of that, you know, policy is, uh, you know, how we uh, maintain what, what type of incidents require it. And so anytime we have a, an incident response that required to turn it on as they make their response and then have it on during the incident. Um, and uh, we, we monitor from there. So it's a part of our, it's a regular part of our evidence collection process in uh, incident investigation and follow-up. What kind of training is involved in the uh, with this technology? Well, it, it actually it actually was not as difficult as I thought. I was I was kind of hesitant with the training piece because I thought we were going to, you know, put something on the officers that was going to be overly complex or, or so um, so challenging to learn to function with that it was going to make it something they didn't operationally use. But uh, uh, we uh, you know we went with the uh, the axon cameras and it, the training turned out to be much more intuitive and the use of the device turned out to be much more functionally easier uh, than I expected. And so it, it, we really just rolled that training into our regular um, uh, taser certification process uh, because of the interconnectivity between the devices and, uh, and it's been pretty, strand, pretty straightforward. Now you talk specifically about, you know, when the cameras should be used, but are there times when they shouldn't be used? Um, not specifically. There are certain interactions that we identify in our policy. Most of those are related to employee to employee interactions. So we, we couch everything in the context of a security incident response. So there's no security incident response that's off limits when it comes to the usage of the body more camera. But there are other interactions that we say are, are definitely off limits. So if you're not involved in an actual security incident response, your camera should not be on. Uh, and so we define that pretty clearly and that's a pretty clear part of our training in the way that we, we teach our officers to function with the device. But uh, in the context of that security incident response, all interactions, all parts of that response are open and available to being recorded. Um, but if you're just standing at a nurse's station talking with staff, well, that's off limits. That's not a, that's not a conversation you need to record uh, because it's outside the context of your role as, as a responder to an incident. So how was your policy developed and who was involved in developing that policy? Uh, the, the primary folks involved in developing the actual language and the policy was myself, um, uh, risk management partners and our compliance partners. And so we, the, the three groups bounced the policy back and forth multiple, through multiple iterations until we came up with a, a, a draft that we were happy with and, and brought that forward to our executive team for approval. So what have been the results of your officers using body worn cameras? Um, significant de-escalation. I will, I will say without hesitation that the usage of the cameras brings behavior down significantly. Uh, even, even in cases, you know, some of the, some of the hesitation initially was that they might exacerbate uh, behavior in certain situations, but that, that has not been our experience. We have seen them be uh, um, a significant uh, reducer to overall escalation, which has been fantastic. Um, I'm sorry, when not, you mean when you mean de-escalation uh, by the subject or by the officer or both? Um, by the subject, by the subject, absolutely. So when we're, when we're dealing with combative individuals, the presence of the camera tends to tamper down the ultimate expression of, of their escalation or frustration. Um, it's also been a, just an incredibly valuable tool, like I said, for professional development. That's been one of the primary impacts I've been interested in. And we certainly see the liability mitigation as effective. So when accusations are made, we have that evidence that's present and available to us uh, to review. Uh, and so we've had opportunities uh, to 
mitigate uh, potential liability issues because we have that evidence available to us. Uh, but then also we've been able, like I said, to use it for opportunities for improvement. So we've been able to look at incidents with our teams, our frontline teams and say, okay, this is how we went through it. That's, that's a good response, but how can we make it better? And what are opportunities and interactions to make it better? Uh, and that's been an, a phenomenal uh, opportunity for us to, to pursue that tactical excellence philosophy. And so um, any advice for other hospitals or healthcare facilities uh, considering the adoption of body-worn cameras? Uh, I would, my, my first piece of advice would really be centered around what's your overarching philosophy as an organization? And what level or what stage of development is your security apparatus? So um, th this is not a, a tool I would roll out unless you have already built an effective development program for your frontline officers. There's, there's a lot of challenges in the healthcare industry when it comes to security officer development, training, things like that. I think, um, you know, certain organizations, you're going to need to take a hard look at your current state before you add a tool like that, because it's, it's a dynamic leap in your response technology. And so you want to make sure that uh, your, your training programs, the other tools that your officers have available, all of those things um, put together in a program that's going to lay a strong foundation for the addition of a camera uh, on the officer's person. Uh, and so I think, you know, looking at that kind of fundamental foundation in your tool set is a good place to start. And then if you choose to move forward with that, then I, I, I encourage it across the board. I think it's it's been a tremendously positive experience for us, uh, and I think it has tremendous value um, for any organization. I don't, I don't see a lot of downside to the tool. And if you had to do it all over again, would you have done anything differently? No, I think the process was was sound. I would have done it a couple of years sooner, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, outside of that, I think the, the process we went through was solid. Uh, we had a good, like I said, collaborative approach. We had a lot of people at the table to help us um, build that uh, build that you know 360 degree view of of both the uh, opportunities associated with the tool and as well as the liabilities associated with it. And so, I feel like as an organization, we took a very um, very solid approach to uh, the rollout. And, and to that point, it's been successful as a result. Thanks. Is there anything else that maybe I haven't asked that, that is really important that you think our readers need to know about? I think, you know, ultimately, you know, I talk about laying that foundation. I think that foundation is critically important. Uh, one, of the, one of the core philosophies we have is the, the concept of the strategic security officer. Uh, and I think any anyone in in security leadership, uh, in particular healthcare security leadership, which is which is my particular area, but anywhere in, in security leadership, has to look at your frontline security officer as a strategic asset. What I mean by that is, in in the in the confines of a 12-hour shift, an eight-hour shift, whatever it is, that officer is going to encounter every possible challenge, whether it's a customer service-related inquiry all the way to you know, aggressive assaultive behavior. And in the context of that, and often cases, the case is they encounter that problem uh, alone and unsupported until the rest of the team can come in and, and help. And so you know, as you build a foundation uh, for whatever tools you deploy, whether that's body cameras or tasers or firearms or whatever that may be, You've got to start with the understanding that there's a significant amount of cognitive development that helps us build an officer who is capable of critically thinking through that myriad of uh, tactical challenges. And so that would be where I start in any case, no matter the organization, no matter the context, how are we developing our officers effectively, uh, both in the behavioral skills that we want them to utilize, but also in the you know, cognitive and critical thinking skills we need them to be able to function with and how do we connect that to be effective strategic resources for the organization because one decision whether it's on camera or not has the potential to ripple out across the entire organization uh, and have that strategic impact and can change the course of the organization and so the resources we invest in that development uh, in association with the tools we deploy with that officer all have 
tremendous value and we've got to really put a lot of focus and effort into how we approach um, the building of that program. And so that would be that would be my my big um, my big ask across the industry, I guess, is, is take that hard look before you jump into a, a new tool uh, to add to the tool belt. You know, where are you in development of your officers from that perspective? Because uh, we know that uh, failure to train effectively is training to fail in a lot of ways. And that's a that's a significant issue if we don't address it. Great points, Mike. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you very much.